welcome to the latest episode of the Celtic View podcast brought to you in association with Eden Mill. As always, we'd like to thank Eden Mill for their ongoing support of both Celtic Football Club and the Celtic View podcast. I'm Joe Donnelly, reporter at the Celtic View, and I'm joined today by a very well-remembered Celt, a stopper of the 10 and scorer on, of one of the most important Celtic goals in modern history. It's Harold Bratback. Firstly, thank you so much for joining us, Harold. No problem, and thank you for that. I uh, I appreciate to be uh, be able to uh, to speak about the club as such, but also about what happened many years ago. But uh, obviously, uh, with the situation now, it's always nice to be uh, able to uh, give something back to the people that love the club. Yeah, definitely. And just on the, the current situation, how are you doing, and how are your family? Uh, we're doing well. My uh, my wife is still. Uh, um, well, my my. Um, well, can we take that again? Just just rephrase that question. Yeah, sure. Um, so <laughs> how are, how are you doing, and how is your family? Well, it's uh, it's kind of a strange situation for everyone, but uh, um, the the family is doing good. Uh, the kids are, are someone. Well, two of them are at school, and it's. Uh, it's working quite well as as the situation is really strange anyway. But uh, for myself, I'm uh, I'm not I'm laid off for the moment because there's no flights. So uh, that's basically what what I do now. But then again, it's uh, we, we're going to take it step by step, and I think in the end it's going to work out fine anyway. Yeah, and of course the, the the health and safety and well-being of everybody, no matter where you are in the world, is of paramount importance during this uncertain time. You touched upon that there. Um, I'm sure most of our listeners know, but anyone who doesn't, um, you're a pilot. You um, were a qualified pilot while still playing football, and then you picked that back up after you hung up your boots. And I mean, against the current disruption, you said that, that you've been laid off because there are, there are less flights. I mean, it just shows you that this current coronavirus, coronavirus crisis is affecting all walks of life, and, and people have just got to adapt on the fly, really. Yes, it's it's really crazy because uh, um, I mean things that happened. I mean, in the past when things happened, it was basically only uh, not too many people uh, affected by things. But now it's uh, literally everyone that's affected by this, and uh, it even though it's um, even though it's obviously more difficult for, for someone, it's still. Everyone knows someone that is laid off. Everyone knows someone that is out of work now. And there's no travel. There's no... I mean, the, the biggest thing is we all rely on culture, on sports and everything. But now there's absolutely nothing going on. And that's really a strange situation. So in, in that respect, I hope that things uh, will normalize as quickly as possible. Because this is... Uh, I th- don't think anyone would like it this way. So... Let's hope yeah. it's going to be quickly over. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, during these uncertain times, you do kind of put things into perspective. And perhaps football isn't the most important thing in, in the world, naturally. Like we said, you know, like people staying healthy as best they can is the most important thing. But nevertheless, football is such a big part of people's lives. It's a huge part of people's routine. Um, I mean, as an ex-football player, I suppose you can understand that more than anyone, that the absence of football is really disrupting people's lives. It is, and I think uh, what this situation tells you that is that um, uh, it, it's always easy to um, you, well you don't you don't appreciate things you like until you don't have them anymore. Uh, football fans, it's uh, it's really strange as well because you you go to uh, you go to games every week and you talk football and you sleep football, you eat football. I mean, everything is focused around your team. And when that, uh, when that is not poss- possible anymore, it, it seems like everyone misses it. And I think that's, I mean, we, we rely on, uh, in the Western world, we, we, can, we can afford to, uh, to play football and we can enjoy football. So I think it, it tells you that it, it is important, even though it's not as important as... Uh, good health and everything, but I mean, having something meaningful to to um, to focus on is 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 really important. Yeah, and 
I mean, as a football supporter, I completely agree. Uh, I miss the football hugely at this point. Obviously, work in the media as well. Um, so it's made our jobs very challenging. We are among the people who are lucky enough to be able to continue to work. But whenever we speak to the players in normal circumstances, certainly, especially during close season or during the winter break, every footballer that I've ever spoken to wants to play football. It's something they always yeah, say. Um, exactly. we, we play a lot of games in the Scottish game, as you well know. Uh, yeah. But even even in those breaks, you know, they enjoy the downtime and then they're raring to go straight away. As yeah. the players, given there's so much uncertainty about when we can return safely, how will they be feeling just now? I think it's really strange because uh, I it's the exact same, same situation in Norway because we play uh, autumn, spring. So um, the problem for us is not being able to start yet uh, as opposed to Celtic, which is uh, eager to finish the season. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit different, but the situation is the same uh, because the players are not allowed to do what they want to do. And uh okay we can we can still do some some light practices but it's it's uh, i mean the the regulations and the restrictions are so big so it impacts their everyday life as well and i don't think that's a problem the the the, the bigger problem lies within the players not knowing what's happening and uh are we going to finish the season is it going to be uh, a late season start uh, there's so many things that makes the uncertainty the biggest enemy now, I think. And uh, I just try, I think it's important for the players to try to normalize today because this is what is happening today. This is what we need to take care of today. So there's no, no point in, uh, in guessing. Uh, we have to take the guesswork out of the situation because that's going to make you crazy if you, if you, if you think about what's going to happen. So, yep. uh, but I think the players are good. They're, um, they are professionals. And I think in this situation, they really need to show that they really are true professionals. And I think most of them are. Mm -hmm. And a very professional side, which you played in um, back in 1997, 98, when Celtic won the league and stopped the rivals from winning 10 in a row. One of the, the most famous games, famous goals that, that you played in, certainly at Celtic, Harold. Let's wind the clock back to your time <laughs> at Celtic and revisit the goal that helped Celtic win the league that year. Boyd's looking for a possible pass, waiting for the McNamara run. It's a good pass. In for Harold Gladbach! He's done it! Harold Gladbach scores the goal, which may well give Celtic the title. He's been much maligned since he came here. He's had an awful lot to prove. Maybe that's the perfect answer. 28 minutes of the second half gone. A sweeping move downfield. The boy pass. First time in from McNamara. And there's a top-class finish from Brockback. His 10th goal of the season. And that one surely has a gilt edge to it. Talk about that goal in more detail shortly. Um, yeah. But it's been over 20 years since you left Celtic. Can you believe that it's been that long? No, it's crazy. I mean, we, I remember being back for the 10 years on uh, party 12 years ago. And at that time, I really thought it was really a long time since uh, since the, the league title that year. But I mean, now it's 22 years and I mean, uh, time has passed so quickly, but still, uh, the memories are so clearly and so good. So obviously, uh, the 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 game that day, and uh, I mean the the run up to the the end of the season was was really amazing, and I've um, I've been able to look at some of the clips on YouTube and other. Uh, social media and there's also uh, also my mother has taken care of all the, um, the newspaper articles from that time as well so it's it's fun to look back at uh, once in a while to see what what this was really about and I don't think I still I still don't I cannot still understand how big the, the league title that year was and also how important the run-in was because 
uh, everyone I talk to now is they're, they're still talking about that league title. So it's it's really, yeah, I'm I'm really fortunate to be able to be part of that uh, yeah. part of the story. I'm very glad that you were part of the story, Harold. As is every oh, Celtic fan the world over, <laughs> uh, yeah. what you contributed to, especially in that last day of the season. You're speaking now in terms of. And I just struggling to understand how big it was at the time. We speak so much, and we have spoken so much about the importance of the New Year derby game, the one in yeah. uh, January second, nineteen ninety eight. And yeah. of course, even with hindsight, if you're struggling to appreciate the the stature of that game, I mean, you hadn't long arrived in Glasgow before that that derby game. Did you have time to appreciate the importance of that game, uh, or generally what Celtic were hoping to achieve that season at the time, given that you were so short in Glasgow? No, I don't think so because I was thrown into it, and that was my first game as a starter, I think. And uh, obviously, I knew about the hype around the, the old firm games, but um, I, I didn't understand. I, I didn't. Uh, no, I did not understand how important the game was, and uh, being able to play it, being able to 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 win that game, and that, I think that in many ways started uh, the new year as we wanted i don't know what the what the, the standing was after the game but uh, it was definitely the important victory and when you know that we played up until the last game of the season to make sure that we ha- were winning the league it tells you how close it was and obviously that game in january was maybe the the game that sealed um, the seal the faith of the of the the league that year mm-hmm. and just kind of touching upon what you said there uh, against my own experience and speaking to the players both present players and ex players like yourself they say that yeah i mean everybody in world football understands the rivalry in glasgow they can appreciate it they know it's quite fiery there's a lot behind it but it is about experience and you know and players that i've spoken to even players that are in the first team now didn't quite get how big it was and how much it meant to everybody watching on until they played on the pitch. I mean, given what you said there, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would, I would think so. Because, uh, I mean, I would say, luckily, uh, me and the rest of the players, we were focused on playing the next game and going to the next session and, and doing what we should do as professionals. But it's easy to be caught in the moment and, and uh, dwell on... Uh, what can happen, what shouldn't happen, and everything. But I think in total, the team was uh, it was a really good group of players. Uh, the managers were good, of course. So it was just a perfect match for. Uh, it was just a perfect setup for for winning the league that year. But I think it it was a spe- special team, and I still have contact with some of the players, uh, and I really appreciate what we had. And I think that. That was something that made that season so special for everyone. Yeah. That season was the first season that I had my first season ticket as a Celtic okay. supporter. Uh, yeah. I'm 11 years old. I'm making right. myself feel old here. <laughs> uh, I remember the February of, of that season. We'd drawn with Hearts at Tynecastle in the league. Uh, we then played in Fermlin in the Scottish Cup and won 2-1 away from home. So two quite tight games and... Again, I was quite young, but I remember going to Celtic Park for a game against Kilmarnock. Okay. And of course, Harold Bratback scored all four goals in a 4-0 <laughs> win that day. Yes. Um, a striker's dream, I can only imagine. Yes. I mean, uh, I, uh, I I had I was fairly new at the club, so it was really great to have, have that game. But I mean, uh, playing at home, playing at Celtic Park is... I mean, it, it feels like a fortress. And uh, I think that's also something that needs to be uh, actually uh, taken really good care of because it's, uh, I mean, we've been talking so much about uh, the home advantage when we play away and on home at home. It's uh, That's one of the biggest uh, advantages that Celtic has. And I remember I was back in, uh, back in Glasgow watching... Celtic play against Barcelona when they won two one, hmm. uh, and that uh, that just shows you how how important home uh, your home home field or your, your home games are, and uh, that's also uh, in kind of it was I mean even from the first game on the in January against Rangers that year I felt so 
uh, confident at Celtic Park. And I think that confidence, uh, together with the rest of the team, of course, made me score those four goals. I didn't. I'm, I remember reading in the papers that I should have scored three more. So I, <laughs> it could have been even more than that. But I mean, uh, just by playing w- the way we did and uh, feeling the confidence we could have at home. Uh, yeah, I uh, I scored four goals that night. And obviously that also helped us uh, towards the league title. Yeah, for what it's worth, I would never uh, grudge you for not scoring other goals when you've scored four goals, Harold. I was certainly <laughs> delighted uh, that afternoon. I'm sure many Celtic fans were as well. In terms of scoring goals, um, even away from Celtic, speaking to your own career, Harold, I mean, you're, of course, the highest scoring player in the Norwegian Premier League for a long time, um, yeah. up until 2011, I believe, if numbers yeah. are right. Yeah, um, something like that. In the current squad, uh, Celtic have got Lee Griffiths, um, who's just burst back onto form, especially since January. He's yeah. now sitting on 115 goals at Celtic. And if he gets another oh. three, that will take him into the top 20 uh, strikers list in Celtic's history. Um, okay. And like most strikers, he is very focused on his stats. And as an ex-attacker yourself, I mean, how much do those numbers mean and encourage strikers to just keep pushing? Uh, I, I, I can only speak for myself, but I remember myself when I was playing that I was always looking for the next goal. Uh, and I think that's maybe also what what Lee uh, is talking about, because he, uh, as long as he's uh, fit and he's uh, injury free and he can play games, that you, you, you always want that next goal. And uh, obviously... Uh, he will definitely score three more goals. So he will be in the top 20. I mean, uh, if you look at the names in that top 20 list, there's so many good players. Uh, and um, I must admit, I don't know who's on top, but I would guess that some of the strikers that have been there for the last 30 years are on that list. But joining them on that list for Lee's, it's just uh, a magnificent uh, piece of work. So it's, it's congrats to him already. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like some of the players that are on that list, um, Lee very very recently passed John Hartson's goal tally at Celtic. Uh And uh, John spoke on social media. I spoke to the Celtic View podcast as well. Just, you know, really good words of encouragement for Lee to keep going. Yeah. Um, But I can understand that strikers, um, particularly strikers who aren't playing, when they see someone pass the record. I was just curious about your thoughts on that because I know that you were the... Now, you were the top scorer in, in the Norwegian Premier League for a long time, and then someone else takes that mantle over. How does that feel as a striker? Is there any resentment there, or would you admit to that? Uh, yeah, I would admit that. I would very much have liked to have that, rec- have that record. But then again, it's um, I, uh, I think he passed me with six goals. So mm. it's not that many. But then again, it's uh, the, there's so many... Uh, there's so many chances that I missed as well. So I missed more than six goals mm. uh, or six chances when I was playing. So it's always easy to see in hindsight what you could have done or, or what you should have done. But uh, yes, I would I would like to have the record. But I always say <laughs> to people when they ask me uh, about that record and I'm number two on that list, I say that, yeah, he, he scored more than me, but I've got a better average. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's great defense. Yes. Um, Going back to that 1997-98 season in Scotland, uh, I was looking at the the fixtures again just to refresh my memory because it's been a wee while since. And you guys went 14 games undefeated between the start of the year and April that season. And in the current game, we've made a big deal rightly about the current side's form after the new year. In the last two seasons, the January onwards, Celtic have really pushed on and of course they've been hugely successful. And Again, given how successful you guys were that year, you won the league and you stopped um, our rivals winning the league under great pressure. How important is that form in January onwards from a mental point of view, do you think? I think it's important because uh, at the start of the season, you, you uh, I don't say the teams are fumbling, but uh, it's, it's the start of the season and you don't know uh, always exactly how you stand uh, in, in terms of your opponents. But when January comes, it's it's then you're on the uh, then you're down to the last lap on the on the race. So that's uh, that's important to be be well prepared. And I think uh, it 
it's all I'm, I remember myself uh, because especially when I was playing back in Norway here, we we always well we many of the times we we were able to uh, get the league sorted in August September because we were leading with so many points, and I think when you come to January in in Scotland and you show your opponents that we're not going to give away points, we're not going to give away goals, we we might go away to a, a difficult away game against Hearts or whoever, but we still manage to uh, if if we play bad or if we don't play as good as we should, we still manage to get the point. Uh, we don't concede a stupid goal, and it's it's that that's what the opponents look at, and they say, "Oh, it's too it's too uh, it's so irritating when the opponent never gives away goals and the points because then you know it's harder uh, the the closer you get to the finishing line." So, be being able to get that form uh, quickly when January comes, it's it's really important. I yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, and of course, that form stood Celtic that year in very good stead. Um, right up until the last game of the season, in terms of my nerves at that time, I remember <laughs> I probably would have liked the league finished a wee bit sooner, but nevertheless, yeah. the game against St Johnston. Talk us through that. Were you nervous beforehand? I mean, what was going through your head uh, that, that afternoon at Celtic Park? I, I wish I basically wish I could play that game every day for the rest of my life because <laughs> <laughs> because that day was so special. Uh, especially what happens afterwards, because uh, before the game and during the game, you never, you were never sure. Well, when I scored, we were pretty sure that we we're going to win that game because it was mm-hmm. only 15 minutes to go, and uh, I think St. Johnson they had given up when we scored the second goal. Uh, but I think um, for the players and for me uh, personally as well, it was. We tried to make it. We tried to make it. A normal game as as we could because it's it's important to stay stick with the same uh, same uh, I mean every uh, you need to stick with the same routine all the time and I think that's what we did and we were well prepared we had some good sessions before that and uh, I think uh, it also definitely gave us the boost that we were going to play in front of a full house. And as I say it was it was um, Simon Donnelly that you came on for, wasn't it, as a sub? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, and did you have any conversations with Simon afterwards? Do you remember? I know that obviously you'd have been caught up <laughs> in all the all the celebrations. And likewise, Jackie McNamara was it was him that provided you with the assist, wasn't it? Do you yeah, remember any of the chats that you had at that point, or was it all just wrapped up in the, the kind of party atmosphere? No, it was wrapped up in the atmosphere. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I mean, I actually, I, um, I was back in Glasgow in January, and mm-hmm. I met up with Simon then, and I also met up with Simon because I was back for the game against Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, uh, but I mean, we, the, the thing is, there's, there's some. Uh, there's there's some people you you connect better with, and Simon is one of them. Jack, mm-hmm. of course, as well. And I've I've uh, I've also seen Darren Jackson when I was back a few years ago. So mm-hmm. it's it's it was a bunch of good guys. And uh, but but exactly what was said on that day? No, mm-hmm. I cannot remember too much. <laughs> uh, but uh, we uh, we gave. We gave the league title the celebration it deserved, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And yeah. but Henrik Larsson, of course, from there went on to become um, one of the one of the greatest Celtic players of all time. And the time where you were playing with him was near the, the beginning of his time at Celtic. Would you yeah. say that he? I imagine he's among um, the best strikers that you've ever played with. I think that's probably fair to say. Yeah, definitely. I I regard him as the best striker mm-hmm. I played with. Uh, and that's uh, because Henrik is not too big. Uh, he's not the fastest. He's not. I mean, he. You would. Uh, you would. Uh, you would look at him and and see just a very clever and very smart player because mm-hmm. he made his runs so cleverly. He was smart in tackles. He was uh, tactically very very good, and that's what made him. Uh, that good as well, but most of all, I think uh, what sets some players apart from others is that uh, they are consistently good at what they're doing. And mm-hmm. Henrik was definitely one of those players. He 
he uh, he delivered on the highest level in Europe for 10 years and that's you you cannot <clears throat> you cannot uh, compete or you cannot argue with that and uh, it's been an honor to play with him but i mean um it was an honor to be on that team as as i mean as such because there was a bunch of good guys and we had people who were players from italy we had players from france we had stefan mahe we had enrique enrique anoni um uh, and then danish players swedish players it was it was such a bunch of good guys but obviously henrik uh he he turned out to be uh, the best player of that generation but uh i uh I, 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 but yeah, as I said, he he obviously did what he did was best at for years, and yeah. that's uh, just uh, the best call design ever. Um, the, there's three games I I put on my top three list, and uh, and obviously that game is one of them, definitely. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think that it gets better with time? Like I know that you were saying you were so overawed by the celebrations at the time, but just tapping into what you said about being able to look back twenty two years, is that does that make the the achievement even bigger to you? Uh it kind of yeah, it kind of does that because uh we were playing twenty two years ago. We didn't we're not playing now. So it's we have to put it into context. It, we have to put it into the situation where we are now and now we are uh, basically um, I mean we're in a different time now and the, the the football is better they run faster they run longer they jump higher everything is, is has improved of course it has but I mean it doesn't take away uh, uh, what we did and I think that um, I, I think we should um, yeah, we we we, are, we we did we did well. We were a good team, and I think that's uh, that will. I mean, however you talk about it, you can t you can always say that the games were were good and the players were good and everything. But um, what we are talking about now is is a game twenty two years ago that sealed the victory and sealed the league title. So that's that's just something you cannot uh, you cannot hide that from anyone so that's basically what's most important that the league title was won uh, and the quality oh it was definitely good enough to to win so that's that's more than enough for me excellent harold and here's to many more of similar successes for celtic moving forward thank you so much for taking uh, your time to speak to the Celtic view podcast it's a pleasure and I hope that things can return to normal um, for you and your family and for everyone, wherever you're listening. Um, but thank you so much for your time and take care, Harold. No one, no problem. I'll, uh, I'll join you anytime. And uh, hail, hail. Let's meet soon.